Hey, hello to uh, all of our customers out there. Um, this morning, I'm talking to uh, Wayne, Ben and Pavel in our engineering group here at uh, Anderson Global. And I've asked them to just uh, take me through how we approach simulation here at Anderson and what benefits it can bring to our customers and how it helps give a better solution uh, at the end of the day for those customers. So uh, good morning, guys. Morning, Mick. Morning, Mick. Um, let's go and uh, dig into some details. So yes, yeah, going to the beginning, uh, getting more in depth on the, on the casting uh, development. We, like I mentioned before, we start with a DFM, Design for Manufacturing, which is done by our, our engineering manager. And then once we get it in our simulation department between myself and Wayne, we uh, we run something called natural silication, which we look at the casting alone, nothing on it, no gates, no risers. Uh, and what that does is basically shows us the silication pattern of this casting. And ba based on how that silication pattern looks, we will choose an initial orientation for our first full shot. Okay, and, and that solidification pattern is probably driven, I'm guessing, by the, the geometries, the wall thicknesses? 100%, uh, yep. It's basically geometry of the casting and the wall thicknesses is really when it, what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, thinner walls solidify quicker, uh, thicker take a longer time. And there's, of course, gravity factor uh, involved. Okay, and the and the color coding that we're looking at there is telling me what solidification time. Okay. Yep. So blue, and dark blue is faster as it starts getting green. That's the that's the last to solidify. Yes. And right off the get go on this casting, you can see the the heavy sections here, uh, which are between the ports of this manifold, uh, down to the that wall right there. Uh, yeah. So. We already know we have to do something there. This casting needs to be fat. We have to put some risers, possibly cooling to move things around. Okay. We, we have like an initial design for manufactured part. A lot of times we'll start off with the casting completely from the customer, the way that it comes in. And as we run these natural solidifications up front, it gives us a very quick indication of um, changes that we'll have to make to the casting, and that's part of the design for manufacturing process. Right, and so when when you get that and you get the first look, see, then very quickly you're having conversations with the customer about options for for change or wall thickness changes or hollowing out some solid bosses possibly or these kinds exactly, of things. Exactly. Yes. So we use it in conjunction to create that the actual casting model that will be a uh, created in the end. Yeah. All right, keep going, Paul. The, the second step is once we establish the, the orientation, we will mock up uh, our gating system and uh, and risers uh, and and run like a full full analysis, which will include the thermal and flow. Uh, and we just have a generic mold uh, inserts in there. Uh, so, uh, and that's that's how that looks uh, on the screen. And let me play it for um, for you. And what that does is uh, really simulates the tilt of the machine in the foundry. Uh, we can control the timing on pretty much all of it, uh, which obviously faster tilt will be usually faster uh, fill of the mold based on the gating system. So this yeah. mimics what the machine does in the foundry. Because because what we're trying to do, as I just think out loud here, is we're, we're, we're trying to get an optimum solution for the customer. And so we're trying to optimize um, maybe two or three variables here. One would be cycle time, presumably. One would be material yield. 
and then another would be the quality of the casting. I think that's probably all three, right? Yeah, yeah those are the, the main uh, main yeah. ones. Yeah. And on this particular example, as, as you can see on the screen, uh, this is not desired in the casting. It's the excessive velocities here close to 100 centimeters a second. You can see this this flow is kind of uh, turbulent and it, it's something that um, is not desirable. So uh, based just on really without even looking at the silication pattern, because we already have an idea from nature silication what it looks like, we kind of know most likely this is not going to work. Okay. Um, and uh, that's what leads us to, well, we got to try something different. And the uh, 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 idea that popped is, well, we can try a direct pour, uh, which is connecting um, connecting gates and pouring directly into a casting. Instead of having like a runner on the side, these are very short runners here with some risers to feed it. Uh, and and we try that. So, so the, the, pur the purple arises. Correct. So here I don't have to play the whole video, but I can just show different steps, uh, a different timestamp of this tilt. And here we are experiencing a similar scenario. However, we thought the casting being so flat that might work. Uh, and but again, that's something that we work with the customer. That's uh, we don't we don't typically make a decision that hey, this is what we want to do. Or uh, sometimes we do, but it's more of a working back and forth with the customer, you know, and saying hey, you know, what do you think? They are the guys that are you know our customers, and they're going to use the tool. So we we definitely like to have input from our customers too. Yeah, and this specific would, one, um, this customer had requested the direct pour because of the benefits. Uh, when you direct pour, the the hottest metal goes into the casting last, which is desirable for your risers. Um, so when the heat in the hottest metal is up into the risers, it will feed the remaining casting easier. Whereas you know. For the flow simulation, as you're trying to come up with a balance with flow versus the solidification time, um, you kind of go back and forth. As you see later on, as Pavel gets further into it, uh, where we come up and we actually feed it differently, the velocities will come down. But then in the end, it was deemed that it wasn't quite as necessary for the direct pour versus where we're heading with this one. Yeah, you raise a good point there, Ben. Um... It, it it makes sense if a customer quotes a, a part out of their foundry um, without for sure understanding how it's going to be made. They may want it to be made in one particular fashion, direct pour, but by the time it gets to us and we look at the simulation, maybe that's not feasible. So it would really make sense for the for a customer to get involved with us earlier maybe even before they quote it with some basic simulation, quick simulations, just to to, to get them in the ballpark that, that they quote it in a way that we can ultimately make it. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yes. And the next, uh, next iteration we tried was uh, <clears throat> based on what Ben said, uh, we flipped the casting around and we fed from the bottom to control the velocities. That forced us to uh, to have a cold risers and but the velocity lo velocities look a lot better. So on this we have a runner on the left feeding from the bottom. We design runners engaging system based on some simple principles that are used in the casting industry. Uh, we use specific gating ratios. Uh, there's a few of them. We, we like to use the 144 gating ratio. Sometimes we use 124. 
and those are cross sections of the of the runner versus the actual end gates uh, when metal goes into the casting. Oh, so the, so the the ratios of, of um, diameters. So, of cross section area basically. Okay. Rec section. Recommended industry best practices, I go. I guess that's probably what that is. Yeah, which is based on just conservation of energy, really. Mm -hmm. Q1 has to equal Q2, and when something gets smaller, velocities will be higher. Uh, so that's just, just a simple jits of it, really. But it does play a big difference, really. It does. And every single every single try we do. We calculate these things. We have a we have a spreadsheet that we control for for every iteration for every try. We control certain things. We document what we change, and what gating ratios we use, and what results we get. And based on that, we we move to the next step and make it better. Okay. And. On this one, the last use looked uh, much better. You're going to show us, show this. Uh, here we go. Yep, it's playing right now. So, so that's high velocity down the the runner, but we're not concerned with that. We're concerned with velocities inside the body of the casting, aren't we? Yes, when the metal enters the the casting shape, that's really where where you where you don't want velocities to exceed 50 centimeters a second. And that is just kind of a magic, magic number that I believe it's from John Campbell. Uh, I believe a, a British very known uh, casting individual uh, wrote a very, very uh, detailed book on uh, casting processes. And that's kind of became an industry standard. It's not a magic number. Sometimes you can achieve these velocities. And we have to work with what we got, but it's something that became like a, a reference point and yeah. it proved to work well. Yeah, guidelines, I guess. Yes. You know, so you see here, you know, we don't see any excessive velocities when you look at the scale uh, above 50, just here at the gate, and those are staying quite, quite nice you know, below 50, which is what we want. One thing here to point out that uh, advantage of using a simulation software is on this particular setup, we experience uh, uh, metal stalling, meaning because how it was entering and transitioning from this part of the casting here into the front, it just kind of stalled for a moment, which is not good. Mm. Uh, and we were able to to capture that the, with the simulation. So that's going to cause us to do something different. Yes, and that's how we go to uh, another iteration, which we added another runner, uh, and that was due to really a cold shot predictions on this end. Mm. Uh, not necessarily stalling yet. Uh, we knew that was an issue, but we wanted to rule out our cold shot predictions on this end, because as you can see, metal had to travel uh, all the way from here through single runner into the casting, and this riser kind of became uh, pretty cold and not doing the, the, the greatest job of feeding the casting. So we had some concerns. Uh, so we added a second runner, and and that's what this is. Yeah. Okay. That allowed uh, a hotter, hotter metal get into here. Uh, but then that's where we engage with the customer and uh, uh, talk with them, work with them, show them the the, the our concerns, got their input. Now, now, if I'm a customer, I'm going to give you input. Now, you've, I've got all that gating that I've got to cut off. I've got two cups I've got to feed into. You guys are killing me. It's going to cost me more. <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually the issue on, on this um, project where customer approached us and said, 
a we quote this quoted this for uh, one operator and you got two pork ups which we don't feel comfortable one it's a very large pork up i can't remember exactly what the shot was but it was like 25 pounds or more and um i'm like well, well we can work through it you know and that's what that's what we did as we tried the double runner just to rule out the, the cold shot predictions here and that helped but then uh the next step was for us to uh redesign the runner system based on our uh, ratios we kept the ratios that we wanted one four four increased the, the end gate sizes the runner size uh to get that metal in there in a specific time so it was still hot and got a one big pork up here you can see on this one also you'll notice where you flipped the casting back over right you yes flipped it 180 degrees and that was to account to eliminate that stall that you were discussing earlier and allow that hot metal to get up there faster in addition there was plenty of casting modifications as you can see if you were to get closer in there it's it's a more uniform wall thickness over oh. over the casting on the internal shape so we removed some material which which helps as well which which lowers the, ultimately lowers the cost for 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 the customer there to, to make each one so you yeah. would thought you would have thought going more near net would actually be more difficult but in this case i think you're saying more near net has given more uniform wall thickness and it's going to actually be more castable than than the costlier design which had more metal in it correct correct yep that's uh uh, that's always better. Uniform wall thicknesses is something that's very desired in pretty much any casting process. If I'm, if I'm your customer, I'm beginning to feel better now because you're, you're lowering my cost. So it's good. And one advantage also here was um, I'd say many customers like to have a, a show face in a drag, meaning the face that's going to be shown uh, wherever it's mounted on the engine, in this case on, on an engine uh, being a manifold, uh, they like to have it in drag as the, the quality of, of metal is, is better. That's just a typical rule of thumb. Uh, it doesn't always work out, but that's something that uh, pretty much people want. So, so just explain to me, um, what do you mean by uh, show face and then by the word drag? What, does it, what do you mean? Sure. Drag refers to a lower half in the mold, cove as a upper half of the mold. And as the metal enters the cavity, uh, typically it hits the lower half first. Uh, and especially in like a static pores, this is a tilt pore. So as you imagine this tilting, it kind of starts hitting the upper. But if this was a static, it would fill the drag first, the lower half, which you know, when you imagine the parting line being here through the center, this will be a drag half at the bottom. OK. So this was also an advantage. Uh, and, and, and point for flipping this casting. Mm -hmm. The velocities look really good on this setup. Uh, we struggle feeding the heavy sections of this. Uh, Oh, Pavel, I don't think you defined for me what show face was as well. That's really the show face. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> so show face is imagine this being mounted on a, on an engine. Mm -hmm. Well, this will be your show face, right? You got mount face on this casting right here. Uh, maybe if I open it in uh, design software. Oh, show as in visible in when when the products in its wherever it's being used. Finished. Visible, visible so this being a finished casting, yeah. not quite because there is no mount holes yet, but this will be mounted on an engine with these holes. Well, this face is going to show, right? There's an engraving. Yeah. Uh, you know, a logo, a customer's logo. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. this is this is the show face. And this face is kind of underneath, right? Nobody's going to go and can look at under an engine. The, yeah. the first peek at it is right here. 
yeah so that's got to be the best quality whereas underneath as long as long as it's functional and does the job uh, not too concerned by surface finish for instance yes yeah okay so this was kind of uh leaning towards the final everybody was happy with the results of the velocities with the uh but we still struggled with the heavy sections, the casting right here. Um, and that's where we um, that's where we introduced some cooling. OK. And. This will be our final layout where uh, heavy sections on the casting right here, still some there in the wall. So what cooling does is kind of changes the solidification pattern. OK, it makes the metal solidified quicker in one spot versus the other where it's not cooled. So so just explain to me what I'm looking at there. I, I see the, the blue uh, piping. Um, what, what is that? The blue piping represents the cooling lines in the mold. Gray is the casting. Uh, our purple is our gating and risering. So things that beat the casting and yeah. orange are the cores. So. OK, and so so what potentially is confusing is is that we're looking at that blue piping with cooling and it seems to be floating in midair, but really it's actually inside the uh, the mold inside the the, the dye material. Um, and it's providing. Cooling in those localized areas on the casting that's closest to that cooling. Correct. Right. The point behind having the cooling is to force the directional solidification to a specific area where we were really having trouble was a heavy section underneath of the flange area there. Yeah. And the only way to get that metal to to start to go towards the riser was to introduce the cooling and force it to go that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is the, the, would water be pushed through those pipes? Is, is that what would be typical? Water or air. Yeah, some boundaries have water, some don't. Uh, air is helpful. Water is definitely where uh, you see the most effect. And and then there are different uh, materials that can be inserted locally that that have greater conduction effects. I think is that true? That is true. Um, on this particular uh, example, we did not use. We used H13 Premium, which is very works really good, you know, for uh, water cooling where there's constantly hot, cold, hot, cold when the water hits uh, and uh, it prevents cracking in the mold. So oh, right. And H13 is typically going to be more expensive than than other dye materials that perhaps uh, cannot handle the, 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 the cold water cooling versus and the, the cross sectional differences in temperature. That's correct. H13 yeah. H premium is, is a two go material when the water uh, or mold has cooling, and then 41.4 or P20 are definitely cheaper options. But but can't handle cooling necessarily. necessarily. It can. It's just the lifespan of the tool definitely decreases very quickly. So typically for need. those materials, we would maybe we would use air without too much. But when you start to introduce water near a mold that's going to be very hot um it you need the the premium h13 typically so that it holds up and and uh to those to to that environment yeah so so again overall that's that's a discussion with the customer before if you if we get to the point where we have to add cooling it's going to drive cost of the mold yes cooling water i would say yeah Definitely. Uh, typically, customers know that um, you know they they will need some 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 sort of cooling uh, in the mold. And uh, but yes, this information is very helpful in the quoting stages. Yeah, I keep thinking, and I know not a lot of our customers do this, um, and perhaps because quite a few have their own capability when they're quoting their customers. But for those customers that don't have internal simulation it really would be beneficial to get us involved very early before they even quote uh, and just kick us off on some basic simulation so we can really kind of root out some of these concerns early on 
Yeah, we definitely can. That's mm -hmm. very valuable information. Yeah, I would agree. And this is pretty much a final mold design uh, that we're looking here on the screen. Uh, go up and drag mold assemblies. Uh, we put a loose insert in the mold for um, where the cooling is. The reason for it was uh, it had some ribbing here. Uh, the casting where we added the ribbing and those are you know, prompt spots to to premature wear because how thin they are and also being cooling being there. So they're, they're easily re replaceable inserts uh, that you don't have to worry about, you know, replacing the whole mold. You just have an insert, you pop it in and out and you keep on making parts. Uh, so that's the concept there on the mold design. Uh, as far as simulation, before we wrap project up, completely we run one final simulation with all the components so that being said we relieve or on more intricate castings that we try to keep a consistent thickness of the mold and that is for uh, mold distortion purposes so mold stays flat uh, bigger the mold thicker the the section will be and different heat transfer between the casting and the mold. So basically that's how heat is being transferred from hot metal into the mold. If we left this mold thick across like that, it will be sucking heat from that metal quicker. So um, to just do a final check, we'll strip down these components like ejector pins and posts and just use the casting or the gating system course upper and lower insert open drag and run one final simulation of all the components in there and and that kind of at that point we can do uh, one final analysis of everything velocities silication pattern with the cooling cycle times um, upper and lower have mold temperatures that of course there is a range that um as desired well uh, you don't want to run the mold in uh, 200 or a thousand degrees there is a range usually between 650 and 850 fahrenheit uh to where um, people like to run these tools uh, so we assure that there's no hot spots in the mold and and those temperatures are not exceeding or it's not hot enough and that is also an option where the casting is small and not enough heat is being put into the mold from the, every shot and the mold loses heat uh, at that point. So we can do all these analysis and predict it up front. So when it gets to the foundry, um, there's no issues. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.